we're going to officially kick off this webinar. I'd like to thank everyone for coming out today. We have a very exciting topic up ahead. Today, we're gonna to be discussing how to modernize your requirements validation using AI-powered no-code prototyping. So for today's speakers, um, we have some very exciting guests. We have Asif Sharif joining us. He's the founder and CEO of Modern Requirements, a leading requirements management tool for Azure DevOps. Uh, he brings over 20 plus years of experience in the requirements management space. Today, he'll be sharing his insights and best practices. He's also the founder of Copilot for DevOps, the AI assistant built specifically for Azure DevOps to streamline your workflows. And finally, he's the founder of the revolutionary no-code development platform, Code the Swan, which is the focus for today's webinar. We're also joined by Mao, our VP of product. She brings over 10 plus years of product management experience, and she'll be showing you how a functional prototype can help de-risk your project delivery. And then myself here, I'm your host and curator for today. My name is Marcus, I'm the VP of sales. It's nice to meet everyone. Uh, I'm really excited about this topic today. So now that everyone has a little bit of a better understanding about today's speakers, we would love to get to know you a bit better on today's topic here. So in the spirit of keeping this webinar interactive, we'd love to get your feedback on our full, first poll question of the day here. And that is what percentage of total defect costs in software development are caused by requirements defects? So we have just launched the poll right now. The poll is live. We're gonna keep it open for about 90 seconds or so. I see a bunch of answers trickling in. It looks like um, it's going to be right down the middle. You know, is it zero, is it 30 to 40% on the lower end of the spectrum? Or is it towards the higher end, 60 to 70? It looks like 33% here had voted 60 to 70%, another 30% 50 to 60, and another 30% 40 to 70. 30 to 40% was on the lower end of the spectrum here. So let's take a look at what the answer here is today. So the correct answer is 64%. So 64%, now that really tells us that having accurate defined requirements is crucial towards the software development lifecycle here. Uh, Deloitte con conducted an independent study that essentially shown that if you don't have requirements that are well-defined and they don't match up with the software development lifecycle, that can be very, very costly towards uh, product development or delivering projects. So I think this is a great time now to kick off our fireside discussion with Asif and get his take on this topic here today. So Asif, we'd love to bring you on board here and, and get your take. You know, now that we've here heard the audience's opinion about just how crucial this is, you know, You've been in the requirements management space for over 20 plus years. You know, for some of the folks that are here in today's webinar, what are some of the best practices, insights, or methodologies that you've implemented to help people reduce requirements errors? So, you know what? Um, imagine you want to build a custom home. And to build a house, there are many ways to do it. I can give you blueprints detailed specification of the house. Now, un unless you are some sort of engineering geek, you might have a better appreciation reading through the blueprints. But for most of us, it, it doesn't really give us a deep understanding. It might give us sizes and so on, but we really can't understand it. But what if, and, and what do we do? We go to, we go to um, um, open houses or we go to model homes to see what a house looks like. And then you went to another open house or another model, and you can sort of say, you know what, I like this and this, and like that in there, and you can put piece together the, the place you really want. That gives you a much better sense of what you may want. Um, in the same way, what if you could use your application before you build it, right? Uh, that would give you a lot more confidence in your requirements. So that the, there's an alignment between user expectation and what you deliver in the end. So we've been doing that for a long time in the software industry at large. We, we, we do simple wireframing on, on 
in in two decades ago, probably on paper with pencil uh, or just uh, boxes on a screen. And that screen design evolved. And then it became a screen in the UI, but that you could click on and you can validate things and, and you could start going down into a more mature uh, prototype so that people get a real sense of it. And really it's been that journey to presenting to people an end product as early as possible so that they can say, yeah, this is what I want, go build it, do your sprints now, and so on and so forth. Okay, that's that's interesting. You, you talk about the evolution, wireframing, and now we're, we're in a, an age where you can create these functional prototypes. Uh, I'm very curious, you know, as at Modern Requirements, are what are some of the ways that you've used prototyping, you know, within your practice and your organization here? And, you know, if there's any best practices additionally you can share with our guests as well, too. Yeah, so, so one of the things that we've obviously over the years used various prototyping techniques to get close to a mature set of requirements that aren't changing unnecessarily. Um, obviously we work in Agile, so the intent is to evolve the requirements over time, but what if you would get the requirements right up front? Um, I'll give you an example. So when, um, if you back, go back a couple of years ago, we used to have about 30 different internal applications for doing a bunch of things, uh, running our business really. Um, and so what we wanted to do was consolidate all those applications to one application. Okay. Um, and those were, they were integrated in many ways, like an account, uh, a client information would be accessible through many applications. So you have a sort of a, a centralized database uh, with shared elements and, and distinct elements. And so we wanted to build this super app, if you will. Um, and so we started with, with Codeless One where we said, okay, you know what, let's prototype the requirement for demo management, for asset management, for IP management, for, um, for employee management uh, and, so, and project management and so on and so forth. And we started to prototype these applications. You'll see shortly the power of that. Um, and we iterated through it and we ended up deploying codeless one application in probably 90 percent of the cases we actually deployed the codeless one app which we started as a prototype we ended up there were a couple of cases we actually ended up um, going with a SaaS offer um, because we knew exactly what we wanted we go pick the right solution and and we did that there's one case where we are debating if we're going to build it ourselves because that's a very unique application. Um, but, but really the, the process of clarifying our minds was important. In fact, one of the key elements we found is that there were a few applications. Once we modeled it, we determined we did not need it. And had we gone and spent, conventionally we would have spent a few months building the app, it would have been a complete misfire and waste of time and money. Uh, so we were actually able to avert a wasteful activity and just focus on which would bring us great value. Okay, that's interesting. So prototyping, you know, just so I can really understand what you're saying here, really helped um, from an operational perspective, help you shortlist what projects are valuable to pursue and which projects are not valuable to pursue. So that's effectively using it before you build it then. That's interesting. You know, if, if we look at technology as a whole now and how, AI is the hot button topic. It's it's mainstream. It's publicly available, you know, through platforms like GPT. How has AI impacted the practice of, of prototyping? Yeah, for sure. Um, obviously, AI is is the new oil. Um, the the promise of AI is so phenomenal. Uh, we at Modern Requirements and the family of companies. We, we have been using AI in a variety of our technologies and in some areas we are leading by far in the industry. Um, I believe in Codeless One, that is also the case. You see, originally what we did, so the original intent of Codeless One was, you know, let's create a prototype and then iterate through it till we get to a level of maturity. And then you'll decide whether you pivot into development or caught solution or you can deploy a Codeless One app. So, but, but you start with something tangible 
um, that can be put together very quickly. What we determined very quickly is that there are many cases where people don't know what they want. And to the extent people don't know what they want, um, because they've got some high level ideas, but what you could, what if you could present to them an idea and say, is that what you mean? And they'll say, yeah, well, fine, go use it for two days and tell me what you think. They'll come back and they'll give you real feedback because, because to, to, to get feedback at a high level, it doesn't matter. So what we ended up doing was in Codeless One, our initial thing was automation. We wanted to automate a lot of things so we can produce a lot of things uh, without coding. Then of course AI came. So then we said, okay, what if I could take away that, that manual clicking function where I need to have a sense of design? And not everybody has a sense of design. Um, what if that could be taken away? What if the gluing piece could be taken away? What if a whole bunch of things um, can be automated? So we basically took AI and automation, put it together, and that gave us a huge jump into the future. Um, I, I think a lot of app dev is going to be like this in the future, but certainly from a prototyping point of view, it just makes us so much more approachable to the end users and to the executives who are funding it to say, yes, you know what, that's what I want. I'm willing to put money against it uh, because I have a tangible asset uh, or software I can work with nearly instantaneously, right? And that's because of the power of AI uh, combining with automation and all the other genius work that we've done. I think when you mentioned tangible asset and tying back to our original poll about how poorly defined requirements and ambiguity really contribute to all these software defects, it's, it's fascinating to hear that having something that's, you know, people can wrap their hands around and very visualize together really reduces that ambiguity. Now, for somebody who is new to this practice of prototyping or the idea of AI being able to do it for you, what, what, what's the fidelity of these prototypes? Like, what do they look like? Yeah. So, so with Codeless One, the, the prototypes or applications you create are indistinguishable from production ready systems. Okay. Obviously, initially you'll create, it might have limited functionality and then you will uh, provide other instructions to it and prompt it to evolve the application. But soon enough, um, you will have a very high quality, uh, deep fidelity, high fidelity applications uh, with a SQL database with all kinds of security around it, all kinds of uh, workflows embedded in it, integrations, and so on and so forth. So if you wanted your prototype to be shallow, you can do that. If you want your prototype to be deep, you can do that. So it's really a question of what do you want to accomplish? You will find that Codeless One will help you accomplish it. You made an interesting, um, one part of your question was, what if people are not aware of prototyping or AI-based prototyping? So one of the things we try to do is have the AI piece be transparent. So good systems are where AI is not evident. Um, and the system does it. It just system seems intelligent. And that's what we have done. Now, sometimes we'll put in a label that says AI this or AI that, but that's just a button um, you put in or you give it some instructions as to, I want to build an app that does this, and here's my, my, my high level requirements on it, go do it for me, right? Um, so, so making AI invisible is, is one of the objectives we, we tend to have is, is give you the power without the burden of it. Okay. Now for all our attendees today that are within the requirements management space, you know, you could be project managers, business analysts that are new to the technology. What would you say in terms of using something like this? Would it be relatively straightforward? Is it very user-friendly? What would you say to people that are experiencing this technology for the first time? You know what, the, the, to create your first app, as you will see in the next um, few minutes, I hope, that um, creating your first app is, is as simple as simple can get, okay? Very simple. Um, and of course, as you get into more advanced configuration, and so if you wanted to get to become quite competent, 
on all the capabilities of Codeless One, maybe it'll take you a week. If you want to be an expert, well, you have to practice some with a few diff different options. Uh, within a couple of weeks, you should be an expert. Okay, so it's not a deep learning curve. To get started, instant. And then you sort of build out your competencies as time goes by. We are adding more AI into it. And what you'll find that over the next, next quarter and so, it'll become even more intelligent. Um, so, so that you're really in a, um, having a conversation with this model and it'll evolve based on your needs. So we already have a, a lot of that. We are adding a bunch of things in that area in, in, in the next couple, three months. Well, wow, that's that's powerful. Having a conversation with this system to be able to generate prototypes and applications for you. I think, you know, I'm speaking on behalf for, of, of some of our attendees today, but I think right now would be a great opportunity to show you what that looks like. So we're we're going to also invite Mao uh, to the conversation here and ask of Mao, we're effectively going to do a live workshop and show you how you can work collaboratively as a team to create a fully functional application. All right, let's do that. So Maui and I will talk about what we want to build. We'll build something and then we'll evolve it. So you can see how, how the system works, okay? So obviously you can see Maui has already logged into the Codeless One platform. And, uh, and what we'll do is we'll go build an app. So Maui, can you uh, do one thing for me? Create for me a, and I'm going to choose a, to, to choose a domain which is something that everybody can appreciate, right? Um, so I was first going to do an asset management system or something like that, but we'll keep it so that everybody has an understanding of project management, I hope. So, so let's build uh, a project management solution to streamline client projects, right? Track milestones, tasks, and also time management, right? Type time entry. So, so let's do this, yes milestones tasks are perfect yep so thank you asif uh, so now as we you know provided the name and description so here we can work together on the data model of this application uh, which, you know, the, our AI suggests the data model, which includes uh, the data objects. For project management, here we have, say, project, task, milestone, time entry, and so on. And of course, if you want more recommendations, always click show more. And on the right, uh, our AI also recommends you the properties or the details you can consider to include for your data objects. Uh, for example, here for project, we have the name, start and date, you know, budget, and so on. And here, I'm going to ask AI to give me more recommendations, uh, project type, you know, risk, and, and so on. And of course, here, I can also make changes on the fly uh, in terms of the data type. Or I can change the name of the items. So I would change it from, say, project name to project title and click Save. Now I will click Next. Next, the AI also recommends you the object relations. I think a lot of uh, business analysts here are very familiar with this uh, concept. Here, for example, we have one too many for project uh, and task, which read as you know, one project can be associated with uh, many tasks, while one task can at most have one parent object. So this is a one too many relation. And of course, based on your use case, you can always change the cardinality on the fly. Now I would just use the default selection and click next. So you know what's interesting is that yeah, just 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 select something Mao and, and click next. I wanted to yeah, so you can do the selection here. Um, so so Mao is just selecting different uh, ways of managing data. So do you want calendar? Do you want Kanban and so on? Um, but you see, normally to just to define your data model would take time, right? What entities, attributes, and all those things you want. Now AI is recommending it to you, right? And, and when you click on create app, it will go and create the application for you. But this is what it means. It'll create a database for you, a private SQL database for you. Then it'll create your front end, 
It'll create beautiful, professional-looking UI. It will build the middleware for you, connect all the pieces, add security to it. It will also add dashboarding and reporting to it, and and all the other technical uh, infrastructure it will put together. When all of that has been put together, it will publish it um, as an application, and we'll publish it as an application and give it give you access to it. So all of these things will take a couple of minutes based on the size of your application. And when that is done, you will see the application will pop up and you can start to use it. So the application has been built now. Yeah, and and of course we can generate some dummy data and you can you know continue to explore the powerful capabilities of this app. And and I think what I will do right now um, is I'm going to actually uh, you know switch to a, another application, pre-built application, where we have a little bit more data to show showcase the rest of the capabilities. So I think yeah, I think we we still remember like one minute ago we uh, you know choose how we want to visualize your data. Now here we can you know uh, switch between those views. We have your table a table view here, and also we have split view where you can see the overview of your information on the left, as well as the details to the right. And you know and the amazing you... part is that all of this was just created with the click of a button. And then you can fine tune it with, with further instructions, right? You can see this is a beautiful looking application. If you to do drag and drop and glue all the components together to build this app, it would have taken, uh, even if it was a no code but drag and drop approach, would have taken you forever to do this work. Now you can always modify it, but but uh, that's the power of Codeless One. You essentially wish it into existence. Uh, but yes, Mal, please continue. Sh show show us how this application works now that we've created it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So I will continue with you know the data management where you can visualize your data uh, in different views. Um, this is also a card view where you can show each record in a card. As well as you know, you can have a Kanban board where you can drag and drop to change the status of of your projects. Or I think a lot of people are interested in you know our Gantt chart. So here I can ha have a you know uh, you know Gantt chart view for uh, you know my cross project pr progress tracking. However, if I go to an individual project, you can also see I can visualize this, my sub tasks in the Gantt chart view as well. So how Absolutely. amazing is that we not only got a Gantt chart at the project level, but we also got Gantt chart at the portfolio level. So interdependencies between the projects. And, and of course, guys, the important point to note here is this is just one type of app it can produce. You could produce many, many different types of applications based on your business, uh, business needs, your automation needs, and so on. Uh, so the UI you see here are pretty, pretty flexible. Um, in addition to say showing the related or the linked tasks uh, in the Gantt chart, I can also show my linked meeting uh, in a ta traditional table view as well. Of course, if you go to the details page and uh, almost everything you see here is based on a very flexible uh, component, pa uh, component based uh, page structure. But I think our approach is very different from a lot of other platforms where they majorly use drag and drop and require a lot of manual effort to put all those components together. Uh, but here in Code Swan, we actually leverage AI and automation. So I probably spent uh, you know, 30 minutes in total to you know, create and uh, optimize this application. So that process is, uh, is very uh, swift. And of course, I think in terms of the data management, you can upload uh, different types of attachment or check the history who made what changes at which point in time, or you can have internal discussion as well. Uh, That's the amazing thing. You'll see there's so much infrastructure injected into this application that we just created, um, almost obviously effortlessly, right? Um, and that's your starting point. And then you will sort of fine tune it based on uh, what else you want. Or So actually let's talk about fine tuning now. So can you sort of modify the layout? So if I wanted to um, have a, yeah, let's go to the new page. And so here's the layout, we want it to be different. So how would you change it? Yeah, yeah. so making changes or adjustments to the UI here is relatively, uh, I would say very straightforward. 
as you can see, I actually turn on this inline edit button where you see those orange button. So you can actually make changes to the look as well as the functionality of your app. For example, I have a, you know, this meeting uh, input form where you see it's not organized. I simply click on this orange button, go to the form builder here. Of course, I can, you know, drag and drop uh, to change the layout of this form, but I'm going to take a shortcut. Uh, I just click this optimize using AI. So let the AI kind of take the input of this, for, of this form and give me a recommended layout. Now, as you can see, the AI's response is very fast. So we see this new layout suggested by the AI. And of course, again, I can you know, do some manual adjustment to you know, further change the layout. Right. Now, what I would do is after we finalize the layout, I will simply click this update page. And very fast, we change the UI uh, on the fly uh, without a single line of code. That's and amazing. Of course, right. And of I, course, I think. I, I remember about that there used to be days where we want to make a change to a screen and you'd have to put in a change request and go through umpteen steps before anything can happen. And now we can do this. Now imagine if you're in a jet session with your, with your business stakeholders and you're validating your requirements you could be doing a lot of these things directly with them. So it'd be a true chat session, right? And when you're done with your 90 minute session, you actually have a really solid prototype that you can add them as users and they can start to play with it, use it, and provide you real feedback, not sort of made up things in their heads, but real stuff because they're actually now interacting with the application. And so here, another, new, so sorry, go ahead. Of course, here another example is you can, you know, have uh, you know restrictions to your field, such as data type, right? Or if is, is this field is required or not, or you want to apply some uh, character range, data range, or default values, or those data patterns, for example, for US and phone number. Uh, so I think what we're trying to do here is to make sure your data entry requirements are uh, nicely captured. Right. So, so, so tell me, Mao, um, in terms of um, visualization, so what types of uh, reporting can we do? Say, say, say we have tasks, I just want to see certain types of tasks, tasks that are open or, yeah, please. Right, right, yeah. So I think you're discussing about the list feature. Uh, so here you can configure a list which serves as a subset of your records. Uh, for example, if I want to pay attention to my high priority task, I can uh, create a list of it. And now I can just focus my energy on the high priority tasks. You can also you know, leverage a dashboard in reporting to run analysis over your, uh, your overall data set or your, your, your list. Um, so here we support many different types of widgets. Uh, you can have you know, real-time analysis, give you uh, support for your decision-making, uh, but if you want to have more details, you can use our reporting feature where you can run a lot of, you know, analysis, summaries, calculations, and so on. Excellent. So, so let, let's make it more interesting. Um, so imagine when I create a brand new project, so go to the project area. And what I want to do is I want to define an approval workflow. Okay. So when a project is initiated, then somebody, say the VP or somebody gets a has has to approve the project before it can be initiated. Um, so this type of approval workflow, of course, there's umpteen permutation of, of approval workflow that one could do. Uh, how, how would that work? Right. Now I'm going to create a new project, uh, provide some basic information here. So what this will do, it will trigger two workflows. First, it will trigger uh, an approval workflow uh, where it's very easy to configure you can define the specific conditions under which an approval request will be triggered. You can decide uh, who will be the approver. You can set you know, the available approval actions and also specify the subflows after those actions are clicked. So that's one type of uh, you know, workflow we can trigger. Here, I will simply choose to uh, approve it. And now what this will do, you will trigger the other workflow. So I go to the same project and I come here as you could see, we just created this project. 
But once this is approved, we can automatically create some related tasks and also assign them to uh, different stakeholders. And I also created a meeting, right? And this meeting can be linked to your Google Calendar or Outlook Calendar where your um, attendees or related stakeholders can be invited and uh, our integration will find availability on those people's calendar and send the invitation. Uh, so there will be a lot of workflow, no matter it is inside of your system or cross system workflow, uh, can all be nicely handled uh, within our platform. And here I also yeah. want to mention that uh, you know, we, we have a powerful integration bridge, which actually connects Code Swan seamlessly with over 7,000 systems out there. And, and of course, if you have very complex integration workflows or, um, or, or, or it is, a, for example, a legacy system, uh, we also offer you the uh, event hooks and custom API where you can build your integration seamlessly. That's a good one, Mal. So, so guys, you can see with this automation and integrations, you can get a lot of power in addition to the approval workflow kind of uh, um, capabilities. So the, there's a lot of capabilities. Of course, we are just so, sort of showing a variety of capabilities that is available based on your application needs, based on your prototyping needs. You can use the ones that are most appropriate. Um, so now, oh, Mao, can you show us how easy is it to set up the, the approval workflow? Right. Yeah, I can go to the app setting area under uh, you know, approval workflow. The configuration of this approval workflow is also uh, no code. You can determine uh, what will be the condition when the approval workflow is triggered, who will be you know, the approver, approval actions will be there, and what will happen if you know, the actions are clicked. Yeah, yeah. So this is, this is awesome. And obviously, these workflows can be far more complicated than than this simple project approval. Um, so, so you'll see that um, the capability and the power is 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 at your fingertips, right? Um, the 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 other thing now I like to focus on is security. So, when you build applications, you want to give certain people access to certain data. Not everybody should have access to all the data. Um, how would you determine or configure who has access to what information? Right, right, yeah. So I, I think uh, that's a very good point, Asif. I think being clear about you know who can do what in your software very early in this design process is very important for identifying potential issues which are related to data security and data privacy. And this becomes extremely important if you have different uh, types of stakeholders or different team members involved in the same solution. So here, um, by using you know go to code response app model under the row setting, you can have granular uh, you know uh, pr uh, control over who can do what or who can perform certain type of actions inside of your application. Here, for example, we have you know those uh, admin contributor uh, guest. Of course, as admin, I think I'm allowed to uh, do all kinds of uh, you know tasks in this application. But as a guest, I might want to, for example. Do not allow this person to make changes to my application or change the general setting, or just give uh, read-only rights for the dashboarding, reporting, uh, notification, approval workflow, uh, workflow builder, shared form, and so on. And other than that, you can also have very precise control over who can see what data in your application. Again, for guests, I might want some information, like my project information, to be read-only. Uh, other than that, for some sensitive project information data, for, for example, like the budget information, I want to give no access right, because I only want my internal team to see this um, budget related information. And here you might actually ask, say, Hamao, if I have those configurations, how I can validate it? So here I'm going to walk you through a very interesting feature, which I like very much. Again, I'm going to turn on this uh, edit mode. As you could see, here we can view this application in other people's shoes under this edit mode. Of course, if I go to a project a project uh, a, a record as an admin, I can see you know, sensitive information like the budget. But if I change my role to a guest to the same record, you will see the sensitive information are now hidden from me. And of course, there's a lot of uh, you know permutations, a lot of configurations you can do 
Um, another one I really want to mention is, uh, for example, uh, as a manager, I probably can see everybody's uh, record here, uh, time entry record. But if I log in as one of my team members, I will only see my own time entry record. So there's many that's different a, ways. Yeah, that's a good one, because now you can not only segment your data by tables and columns, but you can segment your data by rows. So as in, imagine you're doing a, 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 a ticketing system. And the ticketing system for tickets that come from North America, team A is handling it. So only team A should look at North American ticket, but say uh, team B does Europe. And so tickets that come out of Europe should only be seen by team B and so on and so forth. So you can even segment your data in that way, but somebody who oversees Europe and the Americas can then see both of those. And so you can have these, these ways of segmenting your data. There is one important point to note is, although we are presenting this in English, but the application is multilingual. And that means both the entire application UI will show up in, in, in German, in French, in Portuguese, um, whatever language uh, you're interested in, um, as well as the applications you create support multilingual. In fact, so much so that the user so let's say I build an app that supports English, French, and, and Portuguese. What will happen is I deploy the application as an English language as a default. Somebody else from Lisbon could come and say, hey, I want to use the Portuguese version. They'll just change it to Portuguese. Everything will switch to Portuguese uh, or to German or whatever other language you have selected. And now they can start to use the application in that language, type in content in that language, um, so that's one of the things we have built is the um, ability to create multilingual uh, applications. So, so to to conclude, Mao, is there anything else you'd like to talk about before we hand it back to Marcus? Right, right. I, I think I think the conclusion I would want to make here is, you know. As you could see, this AI-powered no-code app development really ena enable us rapidly build fully functional solutions. Of course, the ideal approach for you depends on you know, the specific use cases and its complexities. And, uh, and our clients actually use this capability to create both production-ready app or, or as fully functional prototype that will guide their development. But I think no matter how you choose to use it, the, the real value lies in you know, time and resource savings as well as the ability to gather a lot of the feedback and even secure early stakeholder buy-ins from, from your stakeholders. So I think that's the, the end of the demo part. And uh, yeah, I'll hand it back to you. Sure, thank you, Mao. Um, so, so guys, um, we are going to, oh, by the way, if you have any questions, please go to the questions section and submit your questions from there. And, and we'll, we'll, we'll answer your questions later on. Um, so I, I, I think that hopefully gave you a good sense of a, an example. Of course, that was just one example of creating a project management application, but you saw it does a lot more than CMS project did, right? So it, it already brought in many types of applications into one platform to, 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 to provide a, a holistic view to a project. Um, but it can do, of course, many types of application based on what you need. But with that, um, over to you, Marcus. Thank you so much, Asif and Mao. That was an incredible interactive workshop there. We saw a lot of the capabilities of Codeless One and the types of projects you can create. Now that everyone in attendance has seen Codeless One in action and the types of prototypes you can develop in real time, we would love your feedback here on what did you like best about Codeless One? Was it the fact that you could render a data model on the fly, how quickly it is to build an application? role-based access for anybody who is more concerned with security and governing their data. Uh, maybe you have a lot of manual tasks that eat up your day-to-day -day and really detract from meaningful work activities and you want to automate. It's the workflow automation part. Or you're a business leader and you need to make data-driven decisions with customized dashboards and analytics. What's your favorite part? I'm gonna leave the poll here for an additional 20 seconds looks like the answers are changing rapidly. Very interesting.
Okay, I see a little bit of movement. I'm gonna give it about five more seconds and we are going to close the poll and share the results. Excellent, okay, let's see what everyone said here. So it looks like the majority here was how fast you can build an application. Uh, I think Asif and Mao had demonstrated there just how quickly that process is. Now, what I'd like to do, everyone see the actually, workshop mm, mm, this one in action. Marcus, I want, to, I want to say something here. The app sure. generation, so when I was young and smart, I used to be a developer. And, and the application that we saw today, which we built in minutes, uh, would have taken a team of most likely eight, 10 people, dev test, POs, um, six months at least to build an application like that, right? Uh, that, that would be an expensive proposition and very time consuming. And even if you created a, just a prototype, even if you wireframe the whole thing, would have taken you a few weeks, right? Um, and so, so I can see why the app, the fast app generation was highly appreciated because if you're going to do rapid prototyping and get feedback from people, you need the responsiveness. They want something, you can figure it, you show it. They play with it, they give you feedback. So in a very interactive session, but that is predicated, predicated on the notion that I can get what I want now and not later, because later I'll forget, I'll get busy, whatever. So what if I can just engage you for a few hours and we can just work through it, come up with, with a final product uh, in a single session or a couple, three sessions? I think that's a great point, Asif. I think in an age where the average attention span is dwindling and we have you know, drop shipping that, that shows up instantly. And then we're in an age where expectations for things to arrive just in time are increasing. The ability to develop an app this fast is definitely very powerful, especially if you're trying to get stakeholder buy-in or create something tangible for your team members to see before you commit resources to a project, right? Now, with that thought in mind, I'd like to do a quick recap here of essentially what we've covered today on prototyping and Codeless One. Now, if we talk about what Codeless One effectively is, it's the ability for you to generate apps with AI-powered suggestions. So as we mentioned earlier, you have an idea, you'd like to bring it to life, you can ideate that proof of concept in a few minutes. Once you have the concept, you have a prototype available. Now you can work on it interactively. You know, the traditional way of software development is you have business analysts or project managers, for those on the call that are in those roles, you create functional requirements documents, you interview stakeholders. A lot of that is text-based. It's open to interpretation. Well, if you had an interactive prototype in a visual development environment, everyone can see exactly what was built. There's no more ambiguity anymore. And now, once you've secured that stakeholder buy-in, you can launch that application immediately. Uh, with a lot of different capabilities built into the ecosystem here. Now, when you bring a Codeless One application to life and make it production ready, you can govern your data. You know, for everyone who's looking to have role-based access control and data governance is very important, you know, you, you have certain parts of your system that you can't expose to different stakeholders. Well, you have all of that functionality built into Codeless One. Automation. Your encumbered by manual tasks every day, transferring data records from spreadsheets to different systems. Well, you can automate all of those workflows now, right? You're working on a project. Your, your project manager needs to have an approval. Uh, traditionally, maybe you go and secure that approval back and forth through 15 different emails. Well, now you can have the automation set up. So it's part of a centralized system. You know, they get the notifications, they approve it. Now all of this is being tracked and centralized under one system of record. Uh, and most importantly, the collaboration piece, right? Once you've built an application together, getting feedback from everyone else is very important. So you can leave the comments in the discussion. You can receive real-time notifications for that application you've built. Uh, there's just an endless amount of possibilities when you've created an app with Codeless One. We are going to now open up uh, the discussion to Q&A. So it looks like we have some questions here, you know, or asked if, let's see here, um is it possible to create prototype identifying programming language 
uh, like React or Java for creating apps for Androids and iOS platforms? So, so what you can do, so the applications that Codeless One produces is responsive. So whether you're using a, a Android tablet um, or an iOS tablet or a cell phone, it will be responsive to that form factor. So you can build the applications for multiple form factors so that you can validate your requirements in, in whichever um, size of your device that you want to use it in. Okay, excellent. It looks like we have another question here. How easy is it to customize an application once you've built it? I think we saw a little bit of that earlier, but maybe ask if you can speak to that a bit further. Yeah, yeah. So th there's various types of um, enhancements you can do directly. So one of the approach we took, the, the enhancements are done in app. Okay. Now you can have multiple instances of the app. So you could have a dev instance and a prod instance if you wanted, uh, or just a validation instance. Uh, and, and in the app, you can configure the application of how you want to um, make it behave. So if you want to add a new new object, uh, add properties, add relationships, add workflows, um, it's 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 very straightforward. You simply go to the admin area, you enable inline editing, and you start to either do it yourself through drag and drop, or just ask AI to do it, and it'll do it for you. Okay, so it sounds like you can have AI populate some of those data records, and you can customize it because it's a modular UI and uh, there isn't really any coding experience or technical experience required then, right? Yeah, and also you don't need uh, design experience. You see, again, the application we showed you that Cordless One produced for us so quickly was looked gorgeous. And there are many different permutations of that, by the way, that it can, it can produce, but it produced it looking really good. Um, a lot of people, when you look at how they build the systems, uh, it, it may functionally do the job, but it doesn't look professional or clean because then you have to hire a UX guy and you have to hire a, a UI developer and sort of put it all together. Uh, now Codeless One just does it for you, right? Which otherwise you'd have to figure it out yourselves. Okay, no, thank you so much for sharing that feedback. Uh, looks like we have another question here uh, on projects here. So within modern requirements, what has been the most powerful productivity you've seen uh, the Codeless One use case being used for? I believe you shared some examples earlier, Asif, but maybe you can talk a little bit about, you know, some of the, the time savings and the ways, uh, you know, our professional development team has been able to use it. Yeah, I mean, certainly I, I think the our, um, so we, we have obviously first-hand experience taking the 30 some odd apps. We, consolidated into a super app for ourselves to run our internal business. Obviously there are other apps we use. Uh, those are more specialized, um, but, but these 30 apps of which we probably have created 25, 27 apps now in Codeless One uh, would have all costed us like 20, 30 bucks a user per month, each app. Um, but, but that's not the case with Codeless One. You buy it for the user and you give them 20 apps in it. And, and you just pay for once. But more importantly, um, when we are implementing, the, the key thing has been we can change quickly, right? Because when your requirements change and now I need to go away for a month to build something, uh, that's too painful for the end user. A lot of lost opportunities. And of course, if you look at your IT group, you might find there's a, there's a backlog of large projects outstanding that have to be done. So whether you're doing internal apps or you're doing apps, say, say you've got partners you're collaborating with, you have suppliers you're co collaborating with, you can create a Codeless One app to, to either validate those requirements that you want to do with different stakeholders, internal or external, um, or if, you, if the application does exactly what you want, you can just put it, into, uh, put it live and start using it. Okay, that, that's great. So, so it sounds like the ability to consolidate various different applications on one platform, reduce your IT costs, that, that's one major takeaway. And then also um, for the requirements folks here, you know, improving the accuracy with those prototypes uh, so you can get early buy-in. 
that, that's great, Asa. Thank you so much. So it looks like we're coming up here on time. First of all, I'd love to thank everyone here for joining today. Really appreciate uh, you coming to attend this webinar and learning more about functional prototyping. Um, we'll be sending out, as I mentioned earlier, a brief survey to get your feedback. That's very important. I know we have some additional questions here in the Q&A that we couldn't cover, but I will leave my, my contact as well too. If you have any direct questions, please don't hesitate to reach out to me directly. Thank you so much again. We have a very exciting roadmap ahead of us with future webinars, so please stay tuned. And we hope to see you again shortly. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you all.